I am a patriot, patriotic, flag-waving American and proud of it. And I want you to know that we are so fortunate to live in this great country. Now, you know, don't misunderstand me. God's not an American. But I want you to know that God has allowed this nation to exist because our forefathers were committed to the Christian faith and they wanted to make sure that you and I had our God-given right and, and privilege of liberty or freedom. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the subject that we are called to be free. There was a French historian named Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, who traveled across our country from coast to coast, and when he returned to France, this is what he wrote. He said, I searched for the greatness of America in her commodious harbors, her flowing rivers, her abundant factories, but I did not find it there. It was only when I went into the churches of America and found it ablaze with the righteousness that I found the greatness of America. And then he goes on to write, America is great because America is good. But if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. See, this is what makes our nation great, is thank God for the men and women, our forefathers in the past, our heroes, our veterans who defended the freedoms that you and I experience. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Where does that righteousness come from? Well, I believe the Apostle Paul addressed uh, where that righteousness comes from in the book of Galatians. He says in Galatians 5, chapter 1, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Then later on in verses 5 and 6, it says, For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then later in the chapter, in verse 13 and following, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then even later in the chapter, in verse 24, it says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And then in chapter 6, verses 7 and following, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, you and I are riding off that harvest the generations before us, their righteousness, their goodness, their blessings have been passed down to us generation after generation. And it's all because of the grace of God. Our freedom comes because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And these scriptures explain very importantly that we reap what we sow. So if we live by the Holy Spirit, then it's going to be evident in our life because we're going to have the fruits of that Spirit. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we live by the flesh, then those fruits also are going to be evident in our life. We're going to be consumed with self. We're going to be focused on what we want. We're going, our speech is going to be full of hate. You see, you and I need to understand that this nation was founded on spirituality. And it is so important with the leadership of believers like you and I, we, may, we must make sure that we stick to that foundation. Now, I'm very intrigued and interested in presidential inaugural addresses. Did you know who spoke the shortest inaugural speech? It was President George Washington at his second inauguration. His address was 135 words, and it took less than two minutes for him to speak. I bet that was a popular day among the crowd. On the other hand, the longest inaugural speech was given by William Henry Harrison in 1841. Get this, almost 9,000 words. He spoke for two hours in blowing snow with no overcoat, with no gloves, and no hat, and he died of pneumonia one month later. So what is the lesson of that? Be sure and wear your coat, I guess, and your gloves and your hat, you know. Abraham Lincoln, to me though, and to many others I believe, gave the greatest inaugural address at his second inauguration, which the picture of that has recently been found, it had been lost, but at his second inauguration... And if you're in Washington, D.C., if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., a portion of his address is there, uh, you know, where you can read it yourself because it's engraved on the north wall, and it's a speech that was between four and a half and five minutes, and it's the most theological speech that any president has ever given. In this speech... Abraham Lincoln quotes Jesus Christ twice. He quotes the book of Psalms. He says, The judgments of the Lord are righteous forevermore. He begins by talking about how both sides have been praying for God's blessing. And yet both sides were experiencing the judgment of God because of our own sin and unrighteousness, he said. Within one month of this speech, he will be dead. And in that same month, it will be the end of the Civil War. The final sentence of his address was a great testimony of the greatness of this speech. He says, With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, which is a direct reference from James 1.27, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And this, my friends, is what you and I need to understand, that if we want the blessing of the Lord on our nation then we need to be able to understand that He is a sovereign God and He is at work and we must join Him in what He is doing. We must not try to do our own thing and then ask for His blessing. This nation is great because our forefathers understood that liberty comes from the Lord and it is righteousness that exalts a nation. So the first thing that I want you to see this morning is that the foundation of freedom is an absolute truth. What did our forefathers believe about freedom? Well, listen to this portion of the De Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth 
the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. See, our forefathers in the Declaration of Independence show us that they believed in absolute truth. It says these truths are self-evident. In other words, you can't argue with them. They've always been true. They always will be true. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets the, to the Father except through me. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Yet our culture continues to try to ingrain in young people and future generation that what's right for you may not be right for me and what's wrong for you might not be wrong for me. But in the past, our nation has been the moral compass for the entire world. And it's so important that we understand that truth must be absolute. And that's why there's a movement in our country to do things like to remove the posting of the Ten Commandments. And this kind of thinking is what's leading to our ruin. It's what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. We have got to get back to doing what's right. What the Bible says is absolutely true. We have to stick to that. Peter Marshall, Senate chaplain, in a prayer he prayed these words. Lord Jesus, who art the way, the truth, and life, hear us as we pray for the truth that shall make us all free. Teach us that liberty is not only to be loved, but also to be lived. Liberty is too precious a thing to be buried in books. It costs too much to be hoarded. Help us to see that our liberty is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to do what is right. That's why Jesus said, you will know the truth, and it is the truth that will set you free. And our text, it says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And you and I can gripe and complain about the condition that our culture, our society, our government, whatever it is, we can gripe and complain about the condition that it's in. But when we do that, we're going to have to turn the fingers and we're going to have to point them back at ourselves because we are reaping what we've sown. We have allowed these things to creep into our culture that are not true. They are a lie from the enemy. And so we are reaping what we have sowed. The second thing that I want you to see is that freedom is a gift from our Creator. When those, our forefathers, when they were writing the Declaration of Independence, and when they said that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our forefathers believed that we were created by God. The God that you read about in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in your scriptures. And they said that all human beings 
were created equal because that's what the Word of God says, that we were all created by God and that we should have equal opportunity and equal treatment. In our text it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You see, it is sin, it is doing what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do that enslaves us. Jesus Christ is the one that set us free. His righteousness, His kingdom, when we focus on it, when we focus on what He wants, that's when freedom comes. We have the freedom to accept God or to reject God. That is the freedom that God gave us. He created us to make our own choices. And that's the only thing that should be tolerated. Talking about a time of toleration. Is people are allowed to make their own choice. A choice to worship the Creator or a choice to reject the Creator. But our forefathers... As highly intelligent as they were, men like Thomas Jefferson, who had a brilliant, scientific, incredible, philosophical mind, those forefathers did not believe that we were biological accidents. They believed that we were born as a thought from God and that we were created with a purpose. Did you know that 40 days before the Declaration of Independence was signed, that there was a prayer vigil that was declared May the 17th, 1776? The Continental Congress passed a proclamation for prayer and fasting nationwide. Can you imagine if Congress would declare a nationwide prayer and fasting? Confess and be well our manifold sins and transgressions, and by sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease God's righteous displeasure, and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, obtain His pardon and forgiveness. That was the public prayer that was prayed in 1776. Did you know that all throughout the Revolutionary War that there were many calls to prayer? For instance, the Continental Congress set aside December the 18th, 1777 as a day of thanksgiving, passing a proclamation calling for all the citizens of our country to express the grateful feelings of their heart and consecrate themselves to the service of their di divining benefactor and that together with their sincere acknowledgments and offerings, they may join the penitent confession of their manifold sins whereby they had forfeited every favor and their humble and earnest supplication that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot them out of remembrance and that Americans petition God to prosper the means of religion for the promotion and enlargement of that kingdom which consisteth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine a prayer like that coming out of Washington, D.C. today. What in the world would happen if a prayer like that came out? But Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Our forefathers of the past called on us to pray to our Creator. Even all the way back, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, June the 6th, 1944, on D-Day, when our troops were storming the beach of Normandy, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt led the nation in prayer over the radio. He says, Almighty God, our sons, proud of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Then he prayed for another six minutes. And I believe that you and I are missing out on having a president that would pray like that. You and I need to understand how important it is 
for us to have spiritual leadership. Our culture, our political leadership needs to come to believe that it is our dependence upon God, not our dependence on ourselves, that has made our nation what it is. And when we become, uh, when we come to the point where we believe that the government is to give us our rights and protect our freedom, then we have come to understand that that is why people are demanding entitlements. Because we have misunderstood the government's role. Our forefathers said that the government is to secure these rights, but they were already rightfully ours, given to us by God. And listen, when God gives you something, no one's supposed to take you away. God is the source of our freedom. It says in our text, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If we cease to be good, we will cease to be great. You see, number three, freedom is a privilege that we possess. And so many have paid the price for that freedom. Our veterans, those people who have died, those people who have gone in, into tremendous misery, have paid the price. And all the privileges that are ours in this nation are because of what they did, just like you and I experienced the abundant life with Jesus Christ because Jesus paid the price for us. We enjoy freedom in Him because of His sacrifice. We enjoy freedom in this country because the sacrifice of our veterans. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How much of that are you seeing coming out of Washington, D.C. these days? On the Statue of Liberty it says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The truth is, slavery comes when we follow Satan and sin. Freedom comes when we give our life to Jesus Christ because Jesus paid the price for us. And so that leads me to the final thing that I want to say. Freedom is not free. Freedom comes in denying ourselves. Freedom comes in treating others the way we want to be treated. The veterans in our congregation have shown the way. They have set the example for us. They have sacrificed. They have inconvenienced their lives, inconvenienced their dreams, so that you and I could enjoy the freedoms that we have. That's why we honor them today. Have you heard of the Freedom From Religion Foundation? The Freedom From Religion Foundation, what an ironic name, freedom. You know, they don't even understand what freedom is. It's a plan to take away our freedom. As a matter of fact, the Freedom From Religion Foundation got real close to us. Do you remember in Henderson, Texas, when there was a lawsuit about the nativity on the square and they were trying to have it removed? This was a national organization, hundreds of thousands of people, atheists, agnostics, people who say that this, our whole country needs to be freed from the slavery of religion. Well, I can agree up to a point because I don't believe in religion. I believe in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you what, when you know the truth of Jesus Christ, He's the one that sets us free. And our freedom cost God's own Son, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross to save us from our sins, past, present, and future. But keeping this nation on track and living out the freedom that God wants us to have, you and I need to be focused and understand that there is going to be difficult work ahead to keep the freedoms that we have. And if we lose them, then I can only remind you of what Jesus himself said. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. And you and I need to keep that focus in our life as we live for the Lord. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus? Thank you, God, for the truth of your word. It is absolutely true. Forgive us for going away from that word. Forgive us for continuing to accept the thoughts of our culture where people think that what they believe is more important than what your word says. Help us to stand firm. Help us to stand strong. Help us to do it in a way that is with tremendous love and compassion and peace and joy. Help us to do it in a way where we understand, God, that you hold us in the palm of your hand and no one can snatch us out of your hand. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to live in this great nation. God, I pray with all my might, in your powerful name, I pray that we can stand against the enemy and his schemes to take that freedom away. Help us not to let it happen. Our forefathers were willing to sacrifice their fortunes and their lives to make sure that that didn't happen. May we have that same tenacity, and may we not fall for the traps of entitlement, because, Jesus, we know that our government is not the answer. You, God, are the answer. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. I invite you to come to this altar this morning and to pray for our nation. I invite you to become a part of our church family. I invite you to be saved today. You follow the Holy Spirit. Let's worship together.